Hey everyone, I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in health IT. And our guests today are Rich Steinley, he's CEO of Carium, and Scott Pradle, CTO of Carium. Welcome, guys. Welcome, John. Great to be with you. Thanks, John. Good, good to have to be here today. So. Yeah, excited for this discussion. Uh, known Carium a long time, I think since the beginning, maybe, but. Uh, you guys have come a long way and, uh, you know, excited to have you here to tell more about your story and what your experience has been uh, working with customers and engaging patients. But before we go there, uh, Rich, why don't you kick us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself and Carrium. Sure. Well, uh, thanks again, John. Great to be with you. Um, I have the privilege of serving Carrium as CEO, as you said in the intro. And um, I think what I would start with is just why I came to Carrium. I'm from the managed care business for the last couple of decades worked with providers and their care teams across the country. And I felt like Carium Scott and his co-founders had built something that I wished I'd have had in my toolbox for many, many years. Um, and so when we say next generation or, you know, advanced virtual care, you know, what does that even mean? Uh, you know, to me, what it does is it, it enhances and creates that deeper, deeper connection between the care teams and the people that they're serving. Um, it puts that care in the daily lives of patients, and that's what gets us excited. Um, so what does it do? What does it mean? Um, it's it's all the things you'd expect in terms of triple aim, uh, in terms of lowering cost, increasing quality, You know, really helping the burdens of the care teams automating really complex workflows, and then just creating that relationship for a long-term personal uh, care journey, something that healthcare has been missing for a really long time. Um, you know, I, I was on the other side of the fence using tools like this uh, during the pandemic. And a lot of what we saw was that healthcare finally reached out because they had to, because mm -hmm. patients couldn't come to them. Um, and I think Carium is made perfectly for that so that that's not just a reaction to sort of a global pandemic event, but that it's the way we ought to do healthcare um, ongoing. And, and we're really excited to do that. We're helping some of the largest organizations in the country um, from that perspective, really connect to their patients um, and take that to a new level. We're excited about it. Yeah, it's interesting how COVID opened our eyes to like, yeah, we actually should be doing this, <laughs> and it's not as bad as we thought. Like, it really did. Story. It's unfortunate that it took it, but uh, you know, I think it, in the end, it's a good, it's a good outcome. Absolutely, Scott. How, tell us about yourself and uh, and your experience at Carium. Sure, um, I'm one of the co-founders of Carium. So we started the company just about five and a half years ago now. Um, prior to Carium, I spent 20 years in the telecommunications industry. So completely different space, building technology for companies like AT&T and Verizon. Um, and after a couple of startups in that space, really wanted to look for an opportunity to go deploy those same techniques and things we had learned in a new industry. Um, and one of my co-founders, our chairman, Mike Hatfield, came to me one day and said, hey, I think there's a real opportunity in healthcare um, to improve outcomes using technology. He thought technology was going to have a much bigger impact in the coming years on, on just changing the outcome, the cost, uh, really changing everything about healthcare. Um, and so we spent some time, went to conferences, tried to get a, a view of the landscape. Um, and one of the things I took away from the, that time we spent was that technology was having an impact. There were a lot of clinical innovations coming to market. Um, but one of the things I noticed that were people were solving the same problem again and again, uh, they were applying technology to solve those or bring those innovations to market. But from a technology standpoint, the problem was very similar. Hmm. So whenever you find those people solving the same problem again, and again, there's always that opportunity to disintermediate. And that's really what we set out to do is to build a platform that could take people's clinical innovations host them and get them to market much quicker for a lower cost and uh, by still um, producing the outcomes that uh, we had seen uh, attending those conferences. So, Yeah, very interesting. Rich, I mean, you, you commented about patients and engaging patients and how COVID kind of sparked that. But do you think patients really want to engage with their care and, and maybe what's holding them back from engaging fully? Sure. 
a hard yes to your question. <laughs> uh, I really think they do, but the way I would frame it is I don't know that they even know they're allowed to. Mm. Um, you know, it, healthcare can be hidebound and and really uh, slow to change. And the lagging indicator of that is is what patients know is even possible, um, and what and what they can do to engage their health. They're so used to when I'm sick or I have a problem, I go somewhere, I go to a building, right? And and I engage someone, and then I tell them about everything that's been going on in my life. Um, and then they're supposed to, you know, tell me how to fix it real quick. We don't really, we haven't cultivated a culture of that my health is every day, that my health is something that I do. It's a set of things that I invest in versus somewhere I go when I'm sick. And so I do think they want to do that. Um, and you see that in the massive increase of sort of DIY health things, right? All the wearables and all the programs and all the self self-help, self-diet, self-exercise that that you do see people doing, but it's it's uncoordinated. It's not directed by a physician. It's not tied to the larger elements of what they consider, uh, you know, their long-term health to be. And so I think that's a big part of it. You know, what are some other things? Lack of trust. What if I give you more information? What if I let you into my life? They're scared. Um, change is really hard. You know, what if I find out something that I don't, that I didn't like? believe it or not, you know, there's a lot of denial in healthcare. Yeah. Uh, in the US. Ignorance is bliss until it's not right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Until it's exacerbated. Right. And so I think those are some of the reasons, but we, we find, and it's part of what energizes Carrium that when folks are able to do that, whether it's engagement around a surgical procedure, something they have to be in facility for, whether it's engagement in a long-term chronic disease or increasingly engagement in preventative health, um, that people really respond. Um, you know, they, we've had people be cured of certain conditions and say, what well, I'm staying on carrium forever. It doesn't matter, you know? And, and then we have our doctors say, this lets me never have to take my eyes off my patients. So it's creating a new paradigm that I think people do want. They just didn't know it was possible. Hmm. What would you add, Scott? And maybe could you share some examples of engagement from patients on the Carrion platform? You know, maybe some that surprised you or that, you know, because patients hadn't been engaged now they, they were, you know, what happened? Sure. Yeah. So as we uh, approached that problem of increasing patient engagement, one of the things we had to keep our eye on was, was making sure we didn't increase the burden on the care team, right? So we had to take those existing processes and make sure we could um, automate a lot of the the routine uh, engagements that had to happen, but make sure that the care team was still there for those um, those situations where you needed that personal touch. Um, I think in terms of what surprised us, you know, in coming from a new industry, one of the things we heard a lot was um, some of the patients that need the most care, typically the senior population, don't want to use technology and mm -hmm. are just not going to touch um, a product like what Karen was set, set out to build. Um, we've seen the complete opposite. Um, our highest level of engagement is the senior population. They're the ones that come back to the app the most often. Um, you know, I think a lot of that's driven by need. Yeah. Um, and, and having that trusted care team member available, um, quickly, um, at the same time, you know, there's there's always some selection bias there. Like it, we've assumed that they've, you know, picked the app, decided to sign up, create an account, and then, but once they do, the stickiness is really there with that senior population. Yeah. I mean, you're right. The, the need is different. And, you know, I still consider myself young. We still feel invincible, although my health is teaching me otherwise. But <laughs> So that's an interesting observation. Anything you'd add, Rich, examples of, you know, ways you've seen patients engaged that may have surprised you or, or that are just great examples of patient engagement? Yeah, I, I think the thing I, I would just reference something that I that I just said, which is how long of a tail it seems to have, you know, when mm. when it, it goes back a little bit to I said when people see what's possible, but we just have been surprised at how long folks want to 
use it and and continue to engage that way. So maybe I'm done with my surgery and all the aftercare and all the things in a particular program, um, but they get so used to that interaction and the things that it can help in their daily life. So we've actually even had you know customers come to us and say, can you, can you, which is kind of funny tying it to the contract, but they'll say, hey, could you create a new phase of the contract for us so people can just stay on this? Um, and of course that, you know, we love that. That's when, when technology hits you that way, that you want to keep using it, that's powerful. And I think that's what Scott and the, our, the co-founders really saw was how come this isn't more applicable in healthcare? Um, and they saw a way that it could be. So that's what gets me excited. Interesting. What's creating that stickiness? I, I think that's fascinating to hear about. You know, is, is that stickiness from the patient like well-designed technology? Is is it humans, you know, because connecting to humans you know, or, or even just enabling that human connection? Like what is it that makes that stickiness happen? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's both. I'll say that. And then I think Scott can probably answer, you know, even better. Um, how, how it was built to do that. Sure. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I said in an earlier answer that people lack trust in the healthcare and in, in kind of industry itself, but where they don't lack trust and where they have a tremendous amount of it is the personal caregiver relationship, right? I mean, people will do almost anything their doctor tells them. Um, and that's kind of a sacred trust you, you extend that to the care team. And one of the things that, that I try to take real seriously at Carium is how can we not only reinforce that, but enhance it. And so I think at the end of the day, if we do our jobs right, it's an elegantly designed technology that gets out of the way and puts that patient even more in touch with the people that they trust the most. Um, so it's always that person behind it right? The machine is not going to take the place of that. But if we can enable it and, and clear things out of the way, that's where I think we're at our best. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it is is personalization. So really understanding the context of the patient and providing them things that apply to their life um, and where they're at, at at that point in time. So, you know, if they've they've gone through a surgery and recovering, Really, they're going to be presented with things that are um, tightly tied to how they're going to recover from that surgery. Um, so really, it's that that personalization and customization that we spend a lot of time on making sure that we're presenting things to the patient that apply to their life and not just a general purpose. We're going to send you a recommendation based on you know what the average person in the population would would expect to hear at this point in time. So. That's, That's really interesting. I mean, does the technology help enable the humans to do that personalization or, you know, get, cause you're right. Who doesn't want a personalized experience? And we all get burnt out. If you know, you get the patient education that half of it applies to you or whatever it might be. Right. Uh, you know, is, is that one of the other keys is having the technology enable the human to be more personalized? Yeah, I think a lot of it is around uh, as we build out those clinical innovations, like, what's appropriate given the state for that patient. Like it could be a few different categories um, that people are going through. We've done things where it's based on uh, the perceived confidence in ach achieving their goal, like in maybe different material that gets presented. Um, it's how the care team has engaged them most uh, recently, as well as how the patient is engaging with the application. All those things go into adapting how the application is going to present um, information, tasks to the patient on an ongoing basis. So. Interesting. You know, we're in this really kind of odd period, I think, that we all kind of feel in healthcare right now. There's some economic volatility in the world and uncertainty about the future and what all is this going on. And, and healthcare is planning for next year as part of their strategy. You know, what do you hear is kind of top of mind for customers and prospects? You know, maybe you could start, Rich. Yeah, sure. I think I think you're right. I think overall there's a there's an environment of constrained. Um, uh, there's a scarcity environment in healthcare right now. There's almost a feeling of retrenching into kind of core legacy priorities. Um, again, they're a little bit of a snapback from a lot of the innovation and progression that came out of um, the pandemic. So we're seeing that. 
I think how that translates in some of the strategic questions is massive focus on ROI. Um, so not a lot of speculative, hey, this might be the next wave or, hey, this may be the next thing to focus on. Um, immediately demonstrable ROI. Um, huge focus on constrained resources. So what can you do to remove the burden from my physicians, from my care teams, uh, from my administrative staff? Um, and yet, even in that, um, you know, even though a lot of our solutions in particular are focused on doing exactly that, removing work, um, increasing productivity by multiples, um, there's still a lot of times there's a message of like, well, I don't even have the people to focus on helping you, you know, letting you help me do that. Um, and so you have to be very creative uh, with how we enter organizations, um, can't be a heavy touch or heavy drain on IT departments, on clinical staff, um, and helps, you know, makes us have to be really creative there. But but um, massive focus on ROI. And then from a patient perspective, um, less patient experience because it's innovative and great, and more patient experience focus on because they have to focus on the patient to maintain their their own business. Um, you know, there's so many options in healthcare today that a lot of the messaging around, I have to go out and reach, grab and retain this patient base, um, is about maintaining their own core business. Talk to me more about that ROI. Cause I, I don't think most CIOs out there or, or health IT leaders are thinking like, oh, patient engagement is going to give me the ROI that I'm looking for right now. And that the board wants. So how do you approach that? I mean, you talked about some efficiencies that makes sense. You know, how do you approach that kind of ROI equation from a carry-in perspective? Yeah, I think you raise a fair point. I, I think the IT leader is not who's having that discussion, really who's having that consideration and discussion. Um, IT gets into a little more of cost resource constraint. You know, do I want to add something to my architecture? Um, what's What have I gotten out of the last investments? Those kind of things. So it tends to be a little more of a cost equation there. Um, but when we speak to CEOs and particularly clinical leaders that are in charge of delivering the care itself, that's where those equations really matter. And so they're looking longer term at how do I remove work, maximize the staff I have, not have to add to it, in some cases, even be able to diminish it, right? Maybe we can take away administrative um, heft and resources by automating a bunch of those tasks, um, and leaving the medicine in the hands of the sort of few precious resources they have. Um, and then over time, as Carium is able to expand across service lines, across uh, different elements of the business, um, it gets into, I don't have to add to my tech stack, right? So there's another kind of cost to it. But um, the other thing is just pure revenue generation. And so there's a lot of elements there where either, keeping the patient base, keeping the community engaged, coming to that, you know, being a differentiator for that provider um, in their community for uh, innovative quality healthcare, um, or some of the programs that just flat out generate uh, revenue for an organization if they're monitoring their patients in the correct way, if they're uh, taking on risk and being able to lower, again, cost and raise quality there are direct things to the top end of the income statement um, that resonate with business leaders. Interesting. Anything you'd add, Scott, as far as what you're hearing from customers in the current environment? Yeah, no, I think Rich covered it well. The The few things from the technology side that our focus is on is, is really making it easy to deploy. So we don't want these things to become big IP projects that are a burden. Um, making sure we're removing work and not adding work to the care team and improving outcomes for patients. So I think those three things are always, every project, those are our, our goals to um, to achieve. It's interesting you talk about, I mean, both of what you, you, what you both just said, uh, AI seems to promise, you know, a lot of those things and we'll see how it's implemented. How is Carium kind of approaching AI when it comes to the patient experience? Scott, you want to take that one first? Sure. Yeah, so we're taking a very measured approach. Um, we're being careful with where we deploy it. Uh, traditionally, we've used it for things that are numerical in nature. Really, it's doing calculations for us. Uh, you know, 
your blood pressure has an anomaly this week, or that wasn't you that stepped on the connected scale this morning. That was your cat and making sure we can get data that's, that's clean in the system. Um, we're doing some trials now and a lot of testing with, with summarizing uh, the status of the patient to make it less of a burden on the care team to, to kind of read through all the information that's been collected. So it's summarized in a more intelligent way. Um, we're also looking at companies that are, are spending a lot of time focused on making sure that um, AI is safe. Um, there's a number out there that are building AI specific uh, large language models. Um, Hippocratic AI is one that that we've paid a lot of attention to, um, trying to ensure that the AI that's built um, meets all the safety requirements required. Um, that's a big effort, and I know there's going to be a lot of investment in that space in the coming uh, years. And we're focused on making sure that 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 vetting has been done in a sufficient way before we we would release anything that's um, going to impact the patient. Makes sense. So Rich, what's next on the roadmap for Carrium? Yeah, I think I'll I'll jump right off the end of uh, what Scott just finished talking about. Um, one is I think we can do a lot with that, um, with AI without going all the way to the thing that scares people most, right? Despite the simulations that you read about in the press and everything where, you know, an AI engine beat a doctor at diagnosing or those kind of things, that's really the part that makes folks the most skittish, and it should, right? That that advanced medical decision-making is the place where everyone wants to take AI, but scares patients and physicians the most. And I think it's the part that we either have to stay away from entirely or or really, really, really wait um, to, to far down the road. But short of that, I think it can do an enormous amount, um, you know, risk stratification, uh, identifying care gaps, all of those kind of things are things you can put information and intelligence in the hands of the folks that will then make those kind of decisions. So I think that'll be a big part of it. Um, self-service on our platform is a big thing that we're working on. And so what I mean by that is allowing care teams or their administrative teams to uh, tune workflows, to tune their clinical models in Carium so that to, to a point Scott made before, we, we don't want Carium to be a big IT project. We don't want Carium to have a cottage industry next to it of consultants, <laughs> Uh, that have to be employed uh, when you deploy the platform. You know, that there are software platforms that are really well known um, where you can't even begin to install them if you don't do a, you know, a three or four X consulting project next to it. That's not the vision here. So um, we want, and a lot of our customers want to be able to add new pathways, you know, add new surveys, add new forms, tune certain things because they figure out a way you know, to simplify things for patients. And I think we'll continue to really press on that ability for to make it very, very self-service um, and maintainable um, and extendable for our customers. Um, so that's, I think that's where we'll do that. And then again, just touching back on the AI, everything we can do to help stimulate, hey, this would help you have a better financial outcome. Uh, you know, provider, hey, this would actually mm -hmm. improve health outcomes and have the system be smarter and smarter and make those kind of recommendations. Awesome. Scott, anything else you'd add? And it, it must feel great to, you know, go from co-founder to actually seeing so many patient lives being impacted, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, you know, started not knowing much about the industry, not knowing, you know, which customers we were going to gonna go attack and, um, and stayed at it for five and a half years now and seen some some great outcomes. I'd say that the most rewarding ones are the stories we hear directly from patients. And we've had a number of patients reach out to us and say, hey, this helped me. I want to tell you my story. Um, and if you look at our blog, there's a number of stories up there where you know you can see the impact. You can't always see it from the numbers or right. standing back and looking at at the you know the the broad view of, of what's happening on the platform, but those individual stories are are definitely uh, the most rewarding. That's awesome. 
Well, Scott, Rich, I appreciate you both taking time to talk with us and share uh, what I think is one of the most challenging things, engaging patients and, and getting most of us, you know, like I include myself in it, the lazy patient that doesn't want to do the work and <laughs> doesn't want to engage until, you know, until we realize, wait, no, we should be engaged because our health matters. So I appreciate you guys doing all that hard work and uh, and sharing your story. And thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcasting application. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Great to be with you.